part two of Ursula K. Le Guin's story Dragonfly found in Tales from Earthsea is titled Ivory and it's really introducing and focusing on that character and his interactions with the character who we had introduced the titular dragonfly herself, also named Irian, <coughs> with her true name. And what we're going to see with him is he's, he's instrumental in getting Irian to Roke and also helping her to not necessarily discover, but uncover and get on the way to finding some things out about herself, what it is that she really values. And he's a a uh, young but rather jaded character who, as we go through it, it's clear that he thinks that he is going to dominate and be in charge, but he's actually somebody who is lesser in comparison to this big uh, woman, Irian, who is kind of crude and not well-educated and who wants to figure out who she is through her connection with other people, and in particular, through going to the Isle of Roke. And so we get introduced to Ivory. He's not quite a wizard, and he portrays himself as if he's the equivalent of, in, in academic terms, somebody being, as we call it, ABD, which means all but dissertation, when you are a doctoral or PhD candidate, and you still have to do that final thing, people will sometimes hire you to be a instructor or a professor on the basis of an understanding that you are going to finish your dissertation and you are going to have that certification from the people that, that do that sort of thing. So there's something very similar happening here with Roke. Um, and we find out that the master of Erie of Westpool, Birch, wants a wizard with him. The fashion of the time among the nobility was to have a wizard in their service, a genuine wizard, not just some sort of sorcerer, but a genuine wizard with a staff and a gray cloak trained on the Isle of the Wise. And so the master of Iria got himself a wizard from Roke. He was surprised how easy it was to get one if you paid the price. And then we find out the young man called Ivory did not actually have his staff and cloak yet. He explained that he was to be made wizard when he went back to Roke. The masters had sent him out into the world to gain experience. For all the classes in the school cannot give a man the experience he needs to be a wizard. Birch looked a bit dubious at this, rightly so, and Ivory reassured him that his training on Roke had equipped him with every kind of magic that could be needed in area of Westpool on way. And as we find out later on in part three, <clears throat> um, Ivory spends much of his time working with the hand, the master of illusion, learning how to do all sorts of cool tricks, make fireworks, make deer run through. But when it comes to actual needed magic, he actually pawns that off to other people. As we see, um, Whenever Birch had guests from Kebermouth or neighboring domains, uh, the herd of deer, the swans, and the fountain of golden wine made their appearances. But if the masters of the orchards and vineyards came to the master to ask if his wizard might put a spell of increase on the pears this year, maybe charm the black rot off the vines on the south hill, Birch said, a wizard of roke doesn't lower himself to such stuff. Go tell the village sorcerer to earn his <coughs> keep. So it's not just ivory, it's also birch that are you know, giving him a pass on this. And it gets a little bit more poignant because Birch's own daughter has this nasty cough that she just can't seem to shake. And her mother keeps looking at Ivory, you know, to, to heal her, to do the sort of things that a wizard ought to be able to do. So he's, he's not quite a wizard in more than one respect. And what can we say about the guy? He's arrogant, he's selfish, you know, he doesn't think about other people's needs. Uh, and then, you know, he breaks rules and he, he has justifications for this. He's also bitter and he is lustful. Now, the lustful thing constitutes a problem because in Earthsea at the time that we're talking about here, mages are supposed to be celibate. And that's going to play a major 
role in the story. But let's look at a few passages that reveal to us his motivations and his character. And these, these come about in his conversations with uh, Erie and her dragonfly. She asks him about the Isle of Roke, and he says, there are good men there, great and wise the Archmage certainly was, but he's gone. And the masters, some hold aloof following arcane knowledge, seeking ever more patterns, ever more names, but using their knowledge for nothing. Others hide their ambition under the gray cloak of wisdom. Roke is no longer where power is in Earthsea. That's the court in Havner now. Roke lives on its great past, defended by a thousand spells against the present day. And inside those spell walls, what is there? Quarreling ambitions, fear of anything new, fear of young men who challenge the power of the old. And at the center, nothing. An empty courtyard, the Archmage will never return. So he's talking about this experience that he's actually had of being at Roke and seeing that the stories that people tell and sort of the outward facade doesn't measure up. It's kind of hollow inside, at least in his uh, point of view. A little bit later, we have this discussion about rules. He's proposed to Irian, something we're going to talk about that she sneak in. And she says, uh, is it allowed? And he says, I don't care what's allowed. He said with a frown she'd never seen on his face. The archmage himself said, rules are made to be broken. Injustice makes the rules and courage breaks them. If I, I have the courage, if you do. So she's, or he's presenting himself as being somebody who's willing and courageous enough to break the rules that are standing in the way of getting anything important and useful done. And then finally, there's one other passage that I think that uh, we should take a look at as well. Um, he's talking here about, um, you know, what's going on in terms of women and celibacy and uh, he actually um, is going to, you know, say at, at some point, did you think I was one of their eunuchs that I'd castrate myself with spells so I could be holy? Why do you think I don't have a staff? Why do you think I'm not at the school? Did you believe everything that I said? There was a scandal produced by Ivory at Roke, and that's why he was actually expelled from there. Uh, sent back out into the world. And it has to do with his own lust, but also this bitterness that he has about all these things that are put into place. You know, you could say traditions and requirements that he doesn't see a need for. So Ivory is going to meet and befriend and talk with Irian. She already has a kind of rep reputation um, being, you know, this, this uh, uh, interesting person, right? Uh, he asks Birch about this old house, right? And Birch says, that's Iria, old Iria. I own that house by rights. Um, haven't seen the old man for years. He had a daughter. She's called Dragonfly and she does all the work. And I saw her once last year. This is actually the youngest daughter, Rose. She's tall and beautiful as a flowering tree. Right. And uh, so Jan so Ivory is like, well, I should go and find this woman who is beautiful as a flowering tree. And they have an encounter. First, uh, her dogs attack his horse. And, uh, you know, they, they have a, a brief encounter for a while. You know, she uh, does some healing and then uh, she says, you're the wizard then. And he says, Ivory of Havnor, great port at your service. And she says, I thought you were from Roke. And he says, I am. And then she says, you live there? You studied there? Do you know the Archmage? Yes, he said with a smile. Um, and he's, he's actually a little bit hurt himself. Uh, she and Rose have a long talk, which we've already discussed elsewhere, about, you know, does, does she have to be careful with this guy? And um, a lot of their talking centers around Irian wanting to know all about Roke because Irian wants to know about herself and she thinks that there must be something there. So um, they're, they're talking a little bit later about the Archmage and about magic slowly ebbing away and 
not being as strong. And she says, oh, if only I wasn't a woman. And he says, you're a beautiful woman. Why would you want to be a man? So she says, so I could go to Roke and see and learn. Why is it that only men can go there? So it was ordained by the first archmage centuries ago, said Ivory. But I too have wondered. You have? Often, he says, seeing only boys and men day after day in the great house and all the precincts of the school, knowing that the townswomen are spellbound from so much as setting foot on the fields about Roke Knoll. Once in years, perhaps some great lady is allowed to come briefly into the outer courts. Why is it so? Are women incapable of understanding? Or is it that the masters fear them, fear to be corrupted? No, but fear to, that, to admit women might change the rule. They cling to the purity of that rule. And Dragonfly says, women can live as chastely as men. Uh, and he says, well, of course. But witches aren't always chaste, are they? Maybe that's what the masters are afraid of. Maybe celibacy isn't as, as necessary as the rule of Roke teaches. Maybe it's not a way of keeping the power pure, but keeping the power to themselves, leaving out women, leaving out anybody who won't agree to turn himself into a eunuch to get that kind of power. Who knows? A she-mage. Now that would change everything, all the rules. And then he says, you could go to Roke. I could help you get in there. You have the heart, the courage, the will of a man. You could enter the great house. And she says, well, what would I do there? And he says, what all the students do, live alone in a stone cell and learn to be wise. It might not be what you dream it to be, but that too you'd learn. And so she says, ah, there's, there's obstacles to this. And he says, you got a guy on the inside. I can help you get past the doorkeeper. I can help you get there. I can do all these things. So he's hatching this plan that she is going to fall into, seeking out her actual desire, not realizing that he has something different in mind. Actually, two different things. One is to embarrass, if it will actually work, to embarrass the masters of Roke so that he can place himself above them pridefully, arrogantly saying, aha, see, I showed you, you stupid people. But the other is that he's motivated by his desire for Irian, his, at some points, love, at most points, lust and desire, perhaps not just to even have sex, but to, to dominate, to control, to have something over on her as well. And so they, they go on and uh, there's this interesting scene where he tries to cast a spell on her quite early on, impatient with wooing her massive physical indifference. He had worked up a charm, a sorcerer's seduction spell of which he was contemptuous, even as he made it, though he knew it was effective. He cast it on her while she was characteristically mending a cow's halter. The result had not been the melting eagerness it had produced in girls he had used it on in Havnor and Thwill. Dragonfly had gradually become silent and sullen. When he tentatively approached her, taking her hand, she struck him away with a, with a blow to the head that left him dizzy. He saw her stand up and stride out of the stable yard without a word. The ugly hound she favored trotting after her. The hound looked back at him with a grin. She took the path to the old house. When his ears stopped ringing, he stole after her, hoping the charm was working. And this was only her particularly uncouth way of leading him at last to her bed. Nearby the house, he heard crockery breaking. Her, the father, the drunkard, came wobbling out, looking scared and confused, following by Dragonfly's loud, harsh voice. Out of the house, you drunken, crawling traitor, you foul, shameless lecher. She took my cup away, the master of Iria said to the stranger. She broke it. Ivory departed. He did not return for two days. On the third day, he rode experimentally past old Iria, and she came striding down to meet him. I'm sorry, Ivory, she said, looking at him with her smoky orange eyes. I don't know what came over me the other day. I was angry, but not at you. I beg your pardon. He forgave her gracefully. He did not try a love charm on her again. Soon, he thought now, he would not need one. He would have real power over her, power to compel. Where is that power going to come from? Well, in order to get in to the 
Isle of, of, of Roke and the, uh, to get past the gatekeeper, she's going to have to reveal her true name. And Ivory gets her to reveal her true name, Irian, to him, which means that he winds up having control over her if he chooses to use it. But interestingly, before that, something happens. Something that shows that there's, he's not completely rotten inside. Um, she says, Rose always said I had power, but she didn't know of what kind. And I know I do, but I don't know what it is. And he says, you're going to Roke to find out, raising his glass. Uh, and he says, and may what all you find be all you seek. And she says, if I do, it will be thanks to you. And Leguin tells us, in that moment, he loved her for her true heart and would have forsworn any thought of her, but as his companion in a bold adventure, a gallant joke. Then they had to share a room at the crowded inn with two other travelers, but Ivory's thoughts were perfectly chaste, though he laughed at himself a little for it. So there's an aspect of Ivory where he, he does actually care about her. He does actually love her. He does want to help her on her way. He also does want to have sex with her, uh, and we're going to find out uh, this uh, as well. Irian is going to trust him, and then Ivory is going to make a revelation to her after this, after she, um, you could say, gives in to him and uh, gives him her, her true name. He said nothing. In fact, he was at a loss. If he had known it would be this easy, he could have said her name and with it the power to make her do whatever he wanted days ago, weeks ago, with a pr mere pretense at this crazy scheme, without giving up his salary and his precarious respectability. He says, you know, going on, she says, what's wrong? And he says, I only wanted to make love to you. You did? And, she, and he says, did you think I was one of their eunuchs that I'd castrate my spells so I could be holy? Why do you think I don't have a staff? Why do you think I'm not at the school? Did you believe everything that I said? Yes, she said, I'm sorry. And she says, we can make love if you want. And he says, well, what are you? And she says, I don't know. That's why I'm going to Roke. And, um, you know, they, they choose to, to, to do that. Um, he lets her know that really what he'd done is, you know, sneak in, sneak in a girl. Um, and that, uh, you know, things are not what they originally appeared. And then he says, uh, or Le Guin says, it was true he knew her name, Irian. It was like a coal of fire, a burning ember in his mind. His thought could not hold it. His knowledge could not use it. His tongue could not say it. So he can't compel her. She looked at up, up at him, her sharp, strong face softened by the shadowy lantern light. If it was only to make love you brought me here, Ivory, we can do that if you still want to. And then he says, I think we've gone past that possibility. And the section ends with him beginning to instruct her on how she will get into the great house and pass the doorkeeper.